the session already. Thank you very much for joining. And welcome to the webinar, Mobility for All, Integrating Gender Perspectives into Sums and Noms. My name is Nicolas Cruz, and I'm Sustainable Mobility Expert at the Mobilize Your City Secretariat based in Brussels. I work on capacity development and methodologies, and I'm also the regional focal point for Mobilize Your City in the Latin American region. This webinar is part of a set of trainings called Mastering Mobility Series, which intends to build capacities in relevant topics regarding sustainable mobility planning. And for this session, we will explore the intersection between gender and sustainable urban mobility. Um, we prepared this session together with colleagues from GIZ, which is one of uh, our implementing partners at Mobilize Your City. And we also collaborated with Despacio, um, a consultancy firm based in Bogota, Colombia, supporting uh, technical aspects of the mobility component under the umbrella of Euroclima Plus, managed by AFT, who is another of our implementing partners. And last but not least, the city of Maputo, who is a member city of Mobilize Your City, and that is in its way to develop its own sustainable urban mobility plan. Um, so please, we can go to the next slide. Before going to the content, I would like to start with some housekeeping recommendations to have a smooth and an organized session. So the session will be recorded. Um, so if you don't want to appear on the recording, please turn off your camera and mute your microphone. Otherwise you will be there. And we will upload this video on our YouTube channel. So maybe if you don't want to be out there in the internet, uh, it's better if you turn your camera off and your microphone is muted. And also to help you help us have a more organized session. Uh, of course, you can unmute your microphone if you want to add or comment on something and ask questions. Uh, but please raise your hand so we avoid disturbances during the presentations. At any moment, uh, you can use the chat, of course, to send your questions, and I will make sure to get back to that in the time dedicated for this. We will also be sharing some resources on the chat uh, while we're presenting uh, the materials. Uh, so you will have access to all the resources and uh, documents that we will send to you on the chat. And if you have any material of relevance, please also free, feel free to share it as well. Uh, so just to kick off the chat conversation, I will invite you to send us uh, there your name, uh, the organization you're working in and the city you're joining us from. So we get to know each other a little bit already on the chat. Um, so as you may know, after other trainings at Mobilize Your City, and if it's your first time uh, in one of these, uh, again, welcome. But we try to keep activities very interactive and uh, try to open up spaces for participants to uh, give their insights, uh, and that's why we have many session, subsections in during this session. Um, so the first one is the one I'm doing now, uh, the generalities of the webinar. Then we're going to have a warm-up poll uh, for you to give us some uh, perspectives of what you have in mind regarding this topic. Then we will pass to a brief introduction about what gender is and why it matters. And the fourth subsection will be about how to integrate gender approaches into the sum cycle. Uh, like this, we can conclude the first main part of this webinar, and then we will pass to the second main part of the webinar, which is uh, first a group exercise in which we will have a little bit of time to discuss among participants. Then we will have the interventions from our speakers from Baixada Santista Brazil and Maputo Mozambique to shed some light on the practical implementation of this gender perspective into mobility planning. And finally, we will have some time for questions and answers. So uh, the objectives of the session are, uh, of course, uh, understand and explain the importance of gender in urban mobility patterns and behavior and how gender shapes these uh, dynamics and also give some tools, materials and approaches to integrate gender along the SOMP and NOMP process. 
uh, we want to also reflect on lessons learned uh, by cities who have adopted gender perspectives into their sustainable urban mobility planning processes and also inspired uh, inspired you through this webinar uh, to include uh, these topics into your practical work. So uh, for this session and to help us reach these objectives that we set, uh, we have the participation of three amazing women uh, from different parts of the world and who are working on this topic from different uh, perspectives and positions. So first of all, we have uh, Marina Moscoso, who is technical director and leader for the gender area from the Spacio. And she is also director of operations of Women in Motion, which is an initiative that seeks to strengthen women's leadership in the transport sector. Thank you very much, Marina. I see you turn your camera on to see you. We have as well uh, Lloyd Masangaye, Deputy Director of Mobility Transport and Transit from Maputo Municipality. Lloyd is part of a multi-sectoral group that is developing studies and strategies to ensure universal accessibility in Maputo. Thank you very much, Lloyd, for joining us today. We can also see your camera on. Good to see you. Uh, and then we also have Julia Remmers, uh, who is our third speaker and the mind behind the preparation of this webinar. She's currently writing her master's thesis on gender and some planning, and she's working at the GIZ uh, and is part of the Mobilize Your City partnership, taking care of the intersection between gender and mobility. Then I will be the facilitator of the session. And without anything else to add from my part now, I officially welcome all our speakers, and I'm sure we will have a very interesting and insightful session today. So I hand it over to Julia now to dig into the topic. So please, Julia, the floor is yours. Thank you, Nico, for the introduction. Um, I'm really happy to be here. Just uh, again, on my role, I'm sharing insights from the perspective of a very interested learner and the insights I will be sharing come from uh, learning directly from experts in the field and also their writing. And I will start with the first short section on what is gender and why does it matter for mobility. But before we dive into this, um, we would like for you to answer a poll. And my question to you is which words do you associate when you think of the status quo of gender and mobility? So please follow the link in the chat and we will give you a moment to answer the poll. Um, we will look at the results after this chapter. Um, first of all, a definition. What is gender? Gender is a social construct, meaning there's no real essence of femininity or masculinity, but only lifelong learning of socially expected behaviors and roles. And those are closely linked to the opportunities we have. Gender is also non-binary and genderqueer, meaning that people identify with a growing number of different labels for gender identities that lies outside of the binary between male and female. It is a relational process in the sense that these roles are not constructed independently, but in an adversarial relationship between male and female. And it is also a power, a power relation that is structured hierarchically to the advantage of men. And gender is also, and lastly, embedded in other power relations tied to categories such as race, class, age, and um, sexuality. And uh, for us, it's also a very important tool to understand mobility in cities, and that is why we will use it today. So quickly, how gender shapes mobility. On a very basic level, the way we move in and experience a city is not gender neutral. Um, the differences in gender range from modes of transportation, travel patterns, safety, representation in the transport sector and in decision making, availability of necessary data and access to services, jobs and uh, decision making power. And women's access to modes of transportation is limited due to different economical, cultural and social factors. Uh, we will look at the travel patterns and mode choice in a second. And uh, again, there is an intersection of different factors. Uh, but today you will hear me talk a lot about the differences between men and women, and that is mostly caused by where we are standing with the research, that this is still a very binary 
uh, construct that we are working with now. But what I would like to say is that it is not only about the status quo of the travel patterns that we can observe, but we should also look behind where they come from and also um, what influence vice versa our mobility um, systems have in a gendered way. For example, there are gendered consequences of the way we travel for health in the areas of road safety, air pollution and violence against women. So just to quickly show you some of the typical patterns that can be observed globally and over a long period of time. Um, this is based on a study by Rambo Smart Mobility that I recommend. It has a lot of great direct quotes from um, female participants of the study. So what is seen a lot of the times is that women tend to take more trips for purposes outside of paid work to trip chain, use uh, shorter different shorter distance travel as well as more public transportation and walking and men on the other hand to tend to take more trips to and from work traveling longer distances using cars or cycling and a lot of these patterns are based on the fact that globally women carry out 75 percent of unpaid care work Another uh, important factor is representation. So the question of who really shapes the transport systems that we are working with. And traditionally, this is a very male dominated sector. ITF did a study on this across 46 countries and came to the conclusion that on average, there are 70% women in transport related industries with men dominating the highest ranking and highest paying jobs. And uh, these historic imbalances also create barriers of entry for women in the sector. That could mean uh, the way that shifts are organized uh, late at night or facilities or uh, violence and harassment as well as stereotypes and discrimination. What do we gain from uh, changing this? Well, a lot. Uh, there's evidence that shows that there is great benefits in gender diversity uh, for societies, economies and the environment. And of course, we would also fulfill human rights and rights work by creating more balanced working environments and also have a positive impact on po poverty reduction. Next, I would just like to point out on the right side here, we have some consequences of unequal access to mobility. So the violence that many women face in transit leads to a multitude of avoidance strategies that uh, reach up to uh, complete avoidance of mobility altogether. We can see that multiple care responsibilities and trip chaining can lead to time poverty and larger travel times and distances and overall negative effects on accumulation of capital and negative effects on autonomy and quality of life altogether. So why should we change this? Well, by changing this, we would break up the traditional male bias that we have in the transport sector so far. This sector has been, uh, the cities traditionally have been designed predominantly by men for men, for a demographic that is male, able-bodied and car using. And the second point would be that we would provide access, equal access to common goods services and opportunities in the city and strengthening the labor participation of women. Uh, yeah, that's the one <laughs> would also uh, give overall economic potential. We would go with the international trend by recognizing international policies and rights. Um, gender is on the agenda for climate action and safe and affordable accessible mobility is seen to be a human right so uh, we would be in line with those it is also a tool for more effective sustainable transport planning in my view um, by really understanding what is our target group and their needs we would be able to plan better sustainable solutions and we know that by planning those kinds of solutions, there will be benefits for all transport users. So let's look at the results of our poll. What do you associate with uh, the status quo of gender and mobility was the question. So we can 
hopefully see the word cloud in a second and see if this aligns with what we will talk about today. I think we're going to share the results in one minute. OK. OK, we have data gaps, harassment, inequality. Uh, underestimated is an interesting one. Fair travel, unequal, insecurity. OK, I think the biggest ones are harassment and inequality. So now that you are already familiar with um, this system, first of all, thanks for taking part in this. It's really interesting to see that it, I think, reflects what we all will be talking about today. And I would like to ask a second question to you. Um, the link will again be shared in the chat. And for the next section on integrating gender in sums and nums, I would like to ask, which words do you associate with successful gender responsive mobility planning? And we will uh, give you a moment for this and then return after the second chapter. Okay. Good. Then I hope it works for you. Let's move on to the second chapter, which is integrating gender perspectives into sums and nums. Mm, first, I would, yeah, the poll is still open. It's going to be open until the end of the chapter. Here again, we have the general plan for some planning that is used by Mobilize Your City. It has 11 steps in total and four phases, starting with preparation and analysis, then vision, goal setting and scenario building, measure planning, and finally um, evaluation and monitoring, as well as implementation. Exactly, SUM stands for Sustainable Urban Mobility Plan. And the question now is, what is most important when we want to integrate gender perspectives in each of these phases? To sum it up, um, it is very important to integrate it from the beginning to the end, following the uh, gender mainstreaming concept. And in the first phase, it is about understanding the different target groups, their behavior, uh, and basically asking the right questions when we analyze mobility. The second one, we will focus on facilitating the participation of women and men in the decision-making process, then including gender-specific measures, and lastly, putting in place monitoring and evaluation that really provides evidence about the success of gender mainstreaming. And a lot of the findings I will share with you now is based on an EU topic guide on addressing gender equity and vulnerable groups and sums. So we will start with the first section, preparation and analysis. Step one is to set up working structure. Um, analyzing the planning environment means which institutions and departments have the capacity to implement ex these plans and do they have the resources? Do we have the right expertise? And what is needed if we do not have the right expertise? Another important factor would be creating gender balance in the stakeholders we are working with and finally bringing uh, political and public actors on board to support this process to make sure that it will be successful. So when looking for gender expertise, we can look at many places such as NGOs, administrative staff or academia. And one of these options is seen here. This is an NGO called Harassmap that was founded in Cairo, Egypt. And 
they focus on bystander uh, action in creating an environment that does not tolerate harassment. They work with volunteers and the community to create safer spaces and advocacy. And um, the concept has been replicated in many cities. So an NGO like this, I think, could really help provide a lot of data and knowledge for a process like this. The next step is a big one, it's analysis. So first, when planning a SAMP, uh, the first step would be to ask what is known and unknown already? Are there other policies that deal with uh, the same goals of targeting uh, policies towards women? Are there gender differentiated surveys that are already available to us? And then to really reevaluate re in the second step what kind of data are we currently collecting and may, do we need to maybe change it? So a lot of times relying only on quantitative data will not give us the results we would need for gender sensitive planning. So it, using qualitative methods can, for example, make sexual harassment cases much more visible. Uh, one crucial consideration is also the demographic structure of the population as well as the labor market and employment rates based uh, disaggregated by gender. And uh, when we survey trip purpose to distinguish not only between work and leisure, but also care related trips. There is one example that uh, I really enjoyed reading. It was a study done in Georgia where uh, focus group interviews were combined with uh, door to door interviews over 800 interviews were conducted and we will be happy to share that with you as well. In the topic guide, um, there are four steps suggested. So to collect gender disaggregated and other relevant data, to identify the underlying inequalities and causes. This could, for example, be service gaps that are caused by uh, different work modes that cause different uh, times of travel, not to forget to consult with the target groups on their lived experiences and expectations, and then from that uh, onwards to draw conclusions on possible patterns, causes, and their consequences. A concept that I would like to also introduce and stress is the concept of mobility and care. It uh, research suggests that women still spend considerably more time performing care work, and much of this type of work relies on public transportation. So considering this category is really key for creating gender equitable transport systems, and one, one way to do it is to use the right language and to make it visible in our statistics. So the concept of mobility care is a response to this challenge, and um, Categories for analyzing public transport by trip purpose may traditionally conceal care work or unpaid labor and therefore privilege paid employment when we are planning measures. So creating a dedicated category, which you can see in the picture on the right side here, underscores the importance of care work and allows us to better design the measures accordingly. Okay. Space to vision, goal setting, and scenario building. Um, for the building and jointly assessing scenario, step four, it is key to ensure equal participation of transport users. This can be done by involving local interest groups for gender equality in the project. Um, one big way to ensure equal participation is that to make sure that women can actually access these opportunities of engagement, for example, by providing safe transport, um, child care during the meetings and being sensitive to which times we hold those kinds of meetings because uh, due to safety concerns or care responsibilities, women might not want to come to a meeting in the night time. Um, Qualitative methods to use can be safety audits and women only focus group discussions. And there we can really ask for women's needs and reasoning behind them. 
So who should be involved as a stakeholder in creating a vision? There are different sectors that we can work with. Um, some examples would be gender focal point, points of ministries from the government sector, special interest groups in the sector of NGOs, male and female representatives of the private sector and academia. And as an example, um, I would like to introduce the city of short distances as a vision. This is um, set to benefit equal access and transport systems, and it basically means that everybody should be able to reach their daily destinations within 15 minutes of active travel. It is characterized by a polycentric and decentralized distribution of functions, and um, the advantages are improved experience of caregiving, shopping and the use of service and independent travel of children and older people, which is usually which, who are usually often accompanied by women. And it can be summed up as accessibility by proximity. Um, more on the on step five, so what could be an outcome target? Um, what could we define those as? Well, they need to be measurable. So some examples would be the reduction of average travel time for women and men to essential services and jobs, the increased utilization of health services such as births and emergency care, decreased travel time for girls and boys from home to school, uh, an increase of a number of percent of women in paid employment away from the vicinity of their home. We could measure gender mainstreaming in policy and strategy, and uh, we could measure the increase in percent of women in the tra transport sector employment. So just to give you some ideas to get inspired by. Um, some categories of indicators could be based on context, so the situation for women in the urban area or environment, characteristics of our target groups by occupation, age, ethnic background, economic status, uh, efficiency, so how efficient are the measures uh, in the management process achieved, and the impact, so outcome indicators on the impact and ability to ben actually benefit from the measures that were designed. So what kinds of measures are we actually talking about here? Um, I'm having a quick look at the clock, but I think we are perfectly fine. So because women's trip patterns tend to necess necessitate more than one transport mode per trip, it can be very helpful to consider planning tools for modal integration because this can create increased inclusiveness as well as safety. And uh, another thing area that we can look at is the available of different modes of transportation outside of peak hours based on time use surveys. The principle of the 50 minute city is also said to be beneficial when designing measures, which we already spoke about. And one key uh, thing to remember is that women should be actively involved in the measure development. Also, um, isolated measures in only one single of only one single type do not necessarily generate the results that we would like to see. So it is it is uh, advisable to opt for a combination of several balanced and comprehensive solutions. And here you can see some of the categories of measures that are seen to be um, helpful when designing for gender equity. I will introduce them one by one. We have availability, which means equal accessibility of vehicles, stops and public space. This could mean, for example, uh, multi-purpose compartments for prams or wheelchairs. This is on the next slide. Thank you. Another example would be low floor buses and trams. 
stops and stations that have no barriers and that are pleasant to use, as well as good visibility of information and services. So those are kind of all related more to the urban and transportation design. The next, um, the next category of measures, affordability. We know that women are the majority of the urban poor population and a high cost of transport puts um puts an unequal burden on women especially when having to pay multiple times for trip chaining so what could help is reduced fares for specific groups or integrated fare systems meaning that there's no need to buy tickets for each trip when trip chaining next is safety which is a really big concern uh, and a key factor for women in deciding their mode of transportation, but also the use of public space. And um, here, what are some examples that could be helpful are implementing safety design measures, such as the installation of proper lighting along not only stops, but also roadways, to develop the deployment of staff on public transportation and transit stops, allowing requested stops in the evenings to make it um, possible for women to reach closer to their destination. And um, other examples would be public awareness campaigns, as well as capacity building with transportation staff on how to deal with violence or sexual harassment cases. And lastly, we have reliability, um, meaning that we have reliable transport for service options with sufficient frequency and at a required time. This might mean off-peak hours. And this is an interesting one for me. I think this is very closely tied to the perception of safety as well and was uh, very much highlighted in the, the study we talked about earlier from Georgia, where the respondents um, made it clear that they need to rely on a timetable for the buses to take them for example, out of the cities at night. Step eight is preparation for adoption and financing. We can rely on the concept of gender budgeting here. And what that means is basically the application of gender mainstreaming in the budgetary process. So if we want to succeed with our measures, it's important to um, integrate gender budgeting into the overall sum budget. And the underlying question here really is, do our budget decisions have negative, neutral, or positive impacts on gender equality? Questions we could ask for this are which line items are included, how are budget decisions made, who makes the decisions, and who is not included in the decision making, and what are some of the underlying assumptions that might the decisions might be based on. And uh, on a larger scale, many funding organizations require projects to use these kinds of gender responsive approaches. And the funding potential of gender responsive projects is only growing in line with the international trends that we can see. One quick example, um, I think it's a little bit late, but I will <laughs> hurry. Um, in Mexico, this is a good practice example of an awareness raising campaign that was a reaction to the uh, quite shocking study finding of 17.4% of respondents who stopped using public transport out of the fear of crime. An initiative was therefore started uh, that combined public campaigns, trainings for bus drivers, specialized care centers for sexual harassment, as well as efforts to increase the number of women in the staff of police and drivers. And um, the, the example in the example, it was also suggested to focus on infrastructure upkeep, the frequency of services, women's participation in pro programs, as well as functioning sanctions and legal mechanisms against violence. We move on to our final section, implementation and monitoring. So step nine is to manage implementation, meaning procurement. Procurement is a point in the sum process that is a really great opportunity to make demands for equity. And here's a checklist for the formulation of contract requirements. So we could ask ourselves uh, when looking at public services, 
how can how are there any suggestions of how gender perspectives could be integrated into that particular service? Uh, is there a gender balance in the target group? What impact does this service have on men and women as well as other groups? And will this serve? Could this service have consequences that um, might make it necessary to have a gender analysis? Is it based on gender disaggregated statistics that are presented? And is it in line with equality objectives that the municipality already has? Step 10 is monitor, adapt and communicate. Um, monitoring and evaluation so far is most often gender blind, but it is a really great chance for refinement, for clarifying issues and um, redesigning measures on the basis of new concepts and approaches. One great example um, was in Berlin. There are different gender committees for each district that are responsible for the monitoring of gender mainstreaming in the city. What else is important for step 10? Um, well, how can we assess the performance of measures? We need clear performance objectives and indicators and disaggregated robust data on the performance. Um, we can use social impact assessment, which is a tool that helps avoid negative impacts and ensures equitable benefits. And um, to get to a point of evaluation that is gender responsive, we need to take make sure that we start in the right way by starting with gender responsive assessment and objectives. We make sure that down the line we will also have the appropriate um, performance indicators. What kind of performance indicators could we um, could we use? So this could be improved transport opportunities for different population groups, the extent to which mobility needs are met, the level of involvement of different target groups, the level of involvement of interest groups and stakeholders, and importantly, also direct feedback from the target groups on possible improvements of services. Then lastly, we have step 11, review and learn lessons. Um, so all projects should be monitored, evaluated and studies, studied. Um, we, we want to avoid single loop processes and instead go through extensive learning loops to adjust to new knowledge and new generated data. And um, OK, here Nico comes. Uh, <laughs> a major aspect is also capacity building. It is a big learning experience to shift from this uh, bias that we talked about earlier to truly gender responsive and systematic transport planning. So capacity building should be kept in mind and learning of all stakeholders along the process. And I will end there and maybe have a quick look on the poll. OK, so now we are focusing on the progress. Uh, I can see equality, inclusive and participation as well as safety. Freedom of movement is a good one. Security at stations, I think we will learn more about that later on. Flexibility is something good to remember. OK, thank you so much. I think maybe we can share this as well later as a as a reminder. And uh, I would like to just share my conclusion with you really quickly before I give the floor to our wonderful guest speakers. Um, I can also. Yeah, great. There it is. So in my view, from reading all these studies and uh, guidelines, I would say that gender is an analytical tool that is really needed to design more targeted and effective sustainable transport systems. And on the other hand, mobility is known to be a prime enabler of access to opportunities and really the power to shape one's own life. So when we think about gender and transport, 
I would say uh, reducing barriers and biases in mobility planning is not only a question of equal rights, but also of sustainability. And my final words are, let's shift our understanding from nice to have to must have. Thank you. Julia, thank you very much for that insightful presentation. Indeed, I think there are many, many dimensions of mobility that we as transport planners and especially men, we don't consider or we overlook and that are still extremely important in order to improve the quality of life for everyone. I would like to transition now to the practical case studies that uh, our speakers prepared. So we're going to start now with Baixada Santista case. So Baixada Santista, as I said before, is a city member of the Mobilize Your City Partnership. And for those that might not know it, it is a metropolitan area group in nine municipalities in the state of Sao Paulo, Brazil. And it is now going through the process of formulating its SUMP and gender perspectives has been protagonists in this process. So we have Marina Moscoso from the Espacio with us and Women in Motion, of course, uh, who oversees this project. Um, and of course, many others and research in the field of sustainable transport, climate change and gender. And in the umbrella of the technical assistance of Euroclima Plus uh, to Baixada Santista, Marina has accompanied the AFD uh, in making sure that the gender perspective is included in the SUMP. So Marina, thank you very much for being here with us today. And the floor is completely yours now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amati, for, for the invitation. Can you hear me well? Can... We can hear you well. Yeah. Um, yeah, so as, as, as was mentioned, um, I am accompanying the process of the creation of the SUMP for Bashar Santista. It is a regional, regional SUMP, so it, there are some specifics of uh, being a regional project also that it's that it makes it more interesting but also more difficult at some points and I have been working um, with the Espacio for the last six years in, in researching topics related to gender so we are a research center promoting um, quality of life in cities through projects experiments and events the Espacio has um, 10 years of experience um, working in um, different areas such as city climate and life. Um, we have also founded an initiative called Women in Motion with other women from the region. Um, I think the next slide, sorry, it is related to the Spacio publication. So I've seen one of them was uh, shared in the link. Thank you for that. The, but we also have other research um, open for access in our homepage mostly in Spanish, I'm sorry for that, but the, the ones highlighted in yellow are related to gender. Um, if I can speak louder, I will get out of it. Has it improved? I think it's my... Uh, can you speak, please, so we can hear? Has it improved? Can you hear me better? For me, I, I hear you lower now. <laughs> it was better with the headphones, but... Uh... I will yeah, it's, it's, it's not very loud was better before. Yeah. Can you hear me better now? So I will try my yeah, best. Kind of. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so these are the research we have related to gender, all open for access in our homepage. So next slide is um, about the Women in Motion Initiative. Uh, around nine women from the whole region of Latin America came together to form this initiative to promote and strengthen female leadership. So we have three areas of work. The first one is the annual leadership program, which it's now in its third uh, version being implemented. It's an academic mentoring. Um, so someone is recommending me to do something about my microphone. Should I do it? I, I can hear you well. Uh, I don't know. The others it's can confirm. Better now? Yeah, if you, yeah, actually it is. Okay, great. Thank you for the, um, so the annual leadership program, which is um, a yearly um, program that is um, each year is in Spanish and the, uh, the second year is in English. So we are now in the third version. Um, and we have also the Women in Motion Network to promote 
collaborative work among women and also to strengthen their position in their different um, sectors of mobility. And then we have knowledge management, which is uh, research projects that we do, such as this one, which is the definition of indicators for public transportation. So go on to our website and see there are many information and resources there. Um, and then get into my, um, my presentation today. So I will comment on one of the things that already uh, was presented here, the topic guide from the European Union. I would like to highlight one thing, which I think is very interesting. Then I will show you the example of Bacha Santista, what have we done so far? And um, I will finish with some key frameworks, which I think are helpful for um, your work. So um, the next slide is the study that was uh, mentioned before, which I think it's, I really like guides, I think, and frameworks. I think it helps a lot to um, work on already uh, developed topics and um, define frameworks so that we don't forget anything. So I really recommend take to, for you to take a look at the, the study here. I had uh, the link in the chat before. Uh, yeah, so it's here if you want to access it. And what I, beyond everything that was mentioned, so there are actions in this document related to every step. So that's what we just saw, which I think super clear guidance for gender mainstreaming in SUMPs. But I also would like to highlight something which are a guiding principle. So at the beginning of the document, there are eight guiding principles for gender mainstreaming, which are more of general principles for, for everyone to have in mind. And I think they're super important. So I like to mention them. I've just pasted them also here in the chat because I think it's important when we talk about gender mainstreaming or and also intersectionality, um, when we consider not only gender, but also income, race, ethnicity, um, we have to, to understand our vision of a city, right? It's not, it's not I, I don't think it's um, very selling if you just say, we have to include women. I think it's more important if you give a, a, um, a vision of a city that you want. So a vision of a city uh, that includes gender involves these eight guiding principles, which I think are key. And the principles are then mainstream throughout the, the steps of a sum. So for, for example, considering um, functional urban areas, so considering all the city where there are trips related to work, but also relating to caring um, motives, um, is cooperate ac across institutional boundaries. Um, gender is necessarily a cross-cutting topic, so it is important to consider other institutional organiza and organizations, involve cities and stakeholders. I will make some extra recommendations of our experience in Bachata Santista for that. Access current and for f future performance, so collect disaggregated data, qualitative and quantitative data, define long-term vision and clean implementation plans, so consider gender throughout the development of, of the SUMP, develop all transport modes in an integrated manner. So as, as was mentioned, um, carrying trips are more trip chains. So they're not only, they do, normally don't involve just one mode of transportation, but more than one. So developing integrated transportation systems is key. Arrange for monetary evaluation. So when we are at the end phase of developing the, the SUMP, never forget, the gender topics and assure quality. This is for me very important for because normally you just say, oh, we have a social expert and that person can be responsible for gender issues. That's not it. The same happens with bicycle planning. It is a technical topic. You need to have people that are experienced and know the topic. So assure that there are experts involved that know what is necessary. So the next slide I will um, are the um, actions implemented transversely in European Plus urban mobility projects. Um, so I think this is important in general so to assure there's a framework for gender mainstreaming. So the first one is a toolbox for gender mainstreaming in the transportation uh, in the mobility projects, which was developed at the beginning and is a guideline for all participants of the, the European Plus program. So I think this is key because Although there are many studies out there and you can develop a um, library of studies related to gender mainstreaming in transportation, it is 
a very clear um, resource for um, everyone in the program. So it explains the indicators of Iroclima Plus projects related to gender, gives ideas um, of how to implement it in terms of communication of um, indicators, planning, etc., data collection, dealing with institutions. So I think it's super important um, and is a resource that was given at the beginning. Um, there were also different trainings, so um, women from the European Plus projects have participated um, at the Women in Motion Leadership program that I just showed um, on all three versions, and there are also other webinars and um, spaces of, of training that are, I think are key, such as this one. But because there, there's something I want to be very clear, and it is that it is important for um, if you expect someone, there's a mic open, sorry. If you expect someone to implement gender related measures, they need to know what is gender. So I think it was very key to start this webinar talking about what is gender because we sometimes live, live in bubbles and we think everyone knows what is gender and what it means, gender mainstreaming. And although it is more, we see it more and more in the agenda, it, it is not something, I think it's important to be repetitive until everyone understands. So train and capacitate everyone first in understanding what is gender what is um and what it means to mainstream gender and the third with is a transversal action was um including gender topics in the um Iroquois plus logical framework of the urban mobility project um for now this is a this is a complex tool right because it's monitoring 16 urban mobility projects in all of the region uh, and for now, the indicators are only related to counting women, which I think is a uh, constructive critic criticism that we can make that we should go beyond just counting women, right? Um, at the first presentation was shown some um, examples of indicators and my recommendation is just go beyond just counting women. So the next slide is the experience of Bashar Santista. I will be... Um, explaining everything that we have done. So very important for you to know that we are right now at the prognosis phase. So I will have a lot of details to explain on these three phases. And on the last three phases, it is just what we foresee. Um, there's a small mistake in the title of the one, two, three, four, fifth column. So it's action planning financing, but, the, but it's actually the development and adoption of the sum document. Um, so the first thing that we did still when we were defining the terms of reference and the selection of the consultancy was to include a requirement of an expert person in the subject. So the consultancy that won this project didn't have, they had a social and communication expert and we specifically say you need to include someone. And that was the best decision that we made because um, they hired a super good expert from Brazil, which is called Heide Swap. She is a transport engineer that has been um that has been uh studying the topic of gender and for me that was super important because she could not only support the qualitative aspects of the research for example the diagnosis and also for the recommendations of of actions for for the region but she could also support in the quantitative um, aspects of the diagnosis, and I will explain a little bit better later. And also, we included at the TOR a um, clear, specific gender component. For example, um, expecting that the diagnosis had um, in indicates gender issues, that the action uh, plan has gender issues, etc. So the terms of reference already had this indication, which were very important. When we started working with the consultants, in Brazil, they are super good and they have a lot of experience in developing sums, but they don't have experience in gender. And they were always saying that this is something new that no one has done before, so it's very difficult. I felt that they were always putting barriers, right? And we have those topics included in the terms of reference, so it's a, an assurance that they have to be included throughout the, the, the development of the sum. Um, so at the diagnosis phase, um, we had one, let's say, problem or a conflict when we were defining, when we were at the data collection phase. Um, 
we had to do a origin destination survey for cyclists because of the methodologies that were implemented. Um, cyclists were not included. So the other methodology of data collections were um, ticketing data from public transportation and cell phone data. And both um, both methodologies were not, we were not able to gather gender data. So when we, when that was the find that we needed to do an origin destination for cyclists, I told the consultants, please consider uh, the expert that you have on your team, ask her to reveal the survey and to include gender data. So <laughs> they sent me a, or the first version of that uh, survey for cyclists included very four questions related to gender. The first of them were re was related to motive. So after asking the motive of the trip, um, you ask if that motive was for your own um, interest or for someone else. So if the traveling was for you or for someone else, so that would we would understand mobility of care. So if you're traveling not for your own interest, but for some someone other. And then questions related to gender. Um, transgender, sexual orientation, and harassment. And when, and at that point, we had a conflict because the the consultant pointed out um, that um, there were going to be political issues to do that survey because people in Brazil, this is Brazil, so we have a right wing president, and right now emotions are very high related to gender issues. And he pointed out at the email that he did not recommend asking gender, the gender of the person, but that the surveyor or the person doing the interview should as, um, make an as, as, assumption of the, of the gender of the person interviewed. And that is really problematic because you, when you assure, um, make an assumption of, of the gender, it's related to how you present yourself to the world, right? And and per, gender is a self-determination issue and people should be able to say. So when you ask your gender is how you present yourself to the world. And then we wanted to ask if the person was transgender or not. So if that the way you sex and gender were equal or not. And the other question was related to um, sexual orientation and that was one of the questions that was causing the most pro problems. And at the end, we had to take them off. So we just stayed with gen with the first gender question. And it, for me, it was a win because we were able to include the question and not that the interviewer would ask that. But I think th this is an, an anecdote, which is not really an anecdote. I think it happens a lot. And I, I see it as a, a loss because we cannot include sexual orientation nor asking if the person was transgender and it was um but it was for, for me it was a lesson learned that we have to be more specific and um capacitate more people around asking those questions so the other thing Sorry, that we did, marina if you if you let me interrupt you I, because i know you still have some slides left if we could wrap up minding like we have another okay. we have lloyd waiting for also to take the floor so i will Really, thank you. If sure. we could start going to the I can, closing. Sure, I can skip the other ones. I think this is the most important case. Okay. So, in the case of Bashar Santisa, something super important is that we did um, focus groups and two focus groups one specific for women and the other for LGBT um, um, populations. And we were able to gather a lot of qualitative information. And then in the diagnosis, super important that one of the chapters are related to gender issues. So I always have this discussion of either a gender report should be something separate or within the document. And in this case was, I think it's important to be a whole chapter just on gender issues, but still be within the diagnosis document so that the topic is there and is not um, forgotten in a separate document. So throughout the next phases, which are still taking place, so I cannot give you a lot of details of what happened and how we did, but basically we sh just have to assure and be always remind reminding that gender should be included. So um, care specific gender related workshops for defining strategic objectives and scenario, con consider gender data in scenarios, 
for the action plan and finance develop a gender action plan and a shared budget is assigned to gender related measures when uh, adopting the sub document um, involve women's organizations and champions so that way people are advocating for gender issues in the document so you have not only yourself but you have support from other people think about communications and how you communicate at the participatory events I, there are some recommendations that hi they did the gender expert that i think are super important when you think about participatory events consider time zones um time the, the time of the activity so it's not commercial hours but it could be afterward consider we also weekends consider it's accessible by transportation bicycle and by foot so that it's uh, more uh, equal assure gender race ethnicity age and income balance in the participation give options for moms with kids so that you may have a space for the kids to play while you have your participatory activities um and assure coffee break because people cannot some people cannot be without food for more than three hours so this is um sorry for rushing most of the things i had to say the next slides are just some interesting discussions that i, I like to have about theoretical frameworks um, there are many examples here you can see afterwards in the presentation. So it's just giving you some ideas of the challenges, gender related challenges, which I think are interesting, not to forget anything, right? So there's the UK PAC example of gender equality and social inclusion mainstreaming. They have this levels of compliance. Then we have collective uh, point six, which is from Spain. Uh, they talk about three autonomies, um, which I think are super interesting in terms of what you want to achieve with urban mobility. Then you have an, an academic called Levin, and she's um, it identifying categories for gender equality based on European um, plans and documents. And the last one is something that we have developed at the Spatio, uh, the four hours of inclusive mobility. And everything we do, we apply this, this framework, which helps us not forget anything. So we look at mobility patterns, road safety, personal security, and labor participation. And then there's a document that we have made, which works some recommendations in the next slide is in English, recommendations of infrastructure policies and north and awareness related to the four topics of inclusive mobility. So that's it from my side, thank you. Thank you very much, Marina, and I'm so sorry that I had to rush you a little bit, uh, but we need to keep in mind the time. So thank you very much. I think the presentation was very complete, and I think Baixada Santista is going to do a great job including this perspective in its sum, and also like it's worth noting the background work that Euroclima Plus is doing in this regard with the help of Despacio. So thank you very much for that. And now uh, we will move to another geography in a different continent, but still in a Lusophone uh, country. Uh, so we have with us uh, Lloyd Masangaye from the municipality of Maputo, who has been working in the mobility, transport and traffic department for 11 years now. Uh, she has had the chance to engage in activities related to gender and to improve access, urban infrastructure, and public services for women. So Lloyd, thank you very much uh, for being here today with us. And the floor is yours. If you could um, turn your camera on so we can see you, and then we will pass the slides for you. Can Lloyd, are you there? I tried to find she's in the guests. Or maybe she's having a internet problem. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. And now we can see you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, MIC, uh, to invite us to share and show our reality and experience from from Maputo Lloyd Masangai, from Maputo Municipality Council. Well, my presentation must follow uh, six points. Um, 
Hello? Okay. Well, as a contextualization, transport system challenges, uh, Maputo uh, experience, trust strategic lines and uh, perspectives. Well, um, Mozambique is an uh, African country, has uh, located in southwest coast uh, of the continent, and we share borders with five uh, countries, and Maputo in the bottom of the map uh, is the capital of uh, Mozambique and uh, we have a, an area of 346 square kilometers and just over 1 uh, million inhabitants and our city is uh, mm, is part of the metropolitan area uh, with more five uh, three mm, municipalities Matola, Maracuene and Boane and uh, effectively our our city has um, characterized uh, by informal settlements and uh, our roads network of around 1000 uh, kilometers much uh, most of them are in precarious conditions well about our transport system uh, our public transport system, despite its, its deficiencies, cover more than 60% of the daily trip made by the, our citizens. And uh, uh, we, we are facing very uh, uh, many challenges. Um, and the, the challenge of, uh, for mobility in Maputo City are uh, Sorry, next slide, please. Um, as several motivated by insufficient public transport uh, to cover the demand, inadequate infrastructure to serve people with special needs. Um, we also face uh, problems of lack of uh, respect for pedestrian crossings. As you can see in the next, next slide, uh, we also are facing uh, um issues regarding to social challenge uh, harassment violence insecurity in public transport and connected infrastructure i'm talking about bus stops and uh, terminals also we also have uh, uh, cultural and social issues that uh, affect the mobility and the uh, insertion uh, of women of women in the urban environment well, dual of opportunity and benefits for men and women in urban context is also a challenge for our uh, reality. What we can share about the Maputo experience? Well, for approximately five years, Maputo, together with uh, uh, these institutions of cooperation, has been the developing a uh, project to promote inclusion in urban mobility and accessibility. Uh, there are several projects under, under, underway uh, in Maputo metropolitan area that contribute to promotion of sustainable and inclusive uh, mobility. Uh, in this multi-sectorial work, we follow five strategic guidelines, uh, namely the collections of uh, data based on the research intervention in public spaces to, to promote and to improve uh, mobility, technical training and production of normative contacts, uh, policy and awareness. Uh, for the st uh, strategic lines, uh, for example, in 2018, uh, research was carried out on the public transport pilot line uh, uh, corridor, and it was able to understand the type of the, the violence that occurs in this corridor and identify, and identify the uh, unsafe areas. In next slide, we can see two, two, two maps, one showing the bus stops and the and the terminals uh, more safe and less safe 
and another uh, and the right uh, uh, map we have the identification of the type of violence that we can can face in this this these areas well based on this information the map of uh, violence was designed which serve as a guide, guiding instrument for intervention to promote the areas of greatest fragility. We have developed several research um, to understand more and better about the mobility in different areas, perspectives, contexts, and uh, its dynamics. Also, we developed a participatory work uh, of the design uh, uh, for inclusive, safe, and easy to, to implement bus stop with local materials. Well, uh, in the next slide, slide, we can see the model that uh, was approved and adopted not only in Maputo City, but also in the Maputo metropolitan area. Uh, at the moment, we have more than seven five bus stops of these models installed in Maputo City, which represent uh, uh, about 25% of the bus stops in the city. And this model for us is more than the shelter. We guarantee the public, trans uh, the public illumination, public safe uh, uh, space free of obstacles, and unsafe area, bus stops uh, properly signed, posted, and uh, identified. We also uh, intervene in public space next to hospitals, uh, as we can see in this in this picture, uh, the maternity of the larger hospital in the country, bringing better mobility to users. Uh, public waiting areas, parking planning, access ramps, and protected area for pedestrians mobility. Another intervention in public space that we have priorized is in uh, primary schools to guarantee the safe mobility for children uh, to and from schools to reduce the rate of uh, road accident involving children and uh, above all, creating awareness from the beginning about safe mobility with the kids and for the kids. We also have developed the uh, tech, uh, provided technical uh, training for the public transport crew on methods of abuse and violence in public transport in order to provide uh, tools for them to be primary interventions agents in case of abuse in public transport. We intend to encourage uh, and promote uh, in training uh, women to compose the crew and uh, deconstruct some uh, prejudices. There are two guidelines manuals that emerged as a result of the multi-sectorial work. One, it's the installation of uh, public transport bus stops and other uh, for the promotion of mobility with gender equity and diversity. We also carried out uh, public consultation and multi-sectorial debates for the designs of laws and regulations such as uh, regulation for bicycles that we carry out carrying out at the moment. Still in the po police making, uh, we have a PREOP, pre which is an urban law that defines how to improve uh, any public space connected to the public service. We also promote uh, public awareness, next slide, um, mm, through campaigns such as uh, harassment is not a passenger. Uh, the first campaign carried out uh, in 2018, and uh, we still uh, point uh, make a point to make it appear in our our con uh, contents uh, to break taboos and raise 
public awareness about this, this issue. The week of, uh, in this slide you can see uh, our voluntaries and uh, some information related to, to public transport. Well, uh, the week of sustainable mobility is an annual event that we hold with the aim to create uh, platforms for discussion, debates, and general communication around the issues of mobility, accessibility, and uh, um, in the metropolitan area. As a perspective, uh, uh, we intend to co co continue with our research and design of the general map of violence violence in our public transport network to continue the intervention in public transport surrounding the hospitals, primary schools, bus stops and terminals. Also continue with the training and recycle of drivers, men and women, define the protocol for responding to gender abuse in public transport and continue uh, uh, the Sustainable Mobility Week and Awareness uh, Campaigns. Well, as a conclusion, um, I would like to say uh, that working with uh, on issues of mobility and gender is extremely complex um, and challenging, special for a reality like ours which is loaded with uh, prejudices and very strong cultural values. However, from the short part we have, um, we can see that uh, with small steps, small actions, we, we are building a path toward inclusive mobility. And the greatest lesson that we were able to learn and share here is uh, uh, that uh, is unavoidable need to include women in the, in the decision making process because although uh, the issues of mobility and accessibility are transversal uh, the way men and women are impacted are definitely different different thank you very much for attention Thank you very much, Lloyd, for this interesting presentation from Maputo. And also, thank you very much for minding the time. Uh, we finish very close on time. Uh, I'm sure with these many interventions that Maputo has undertaken so far, the some will be very uh, benefiting from it. Uh, and that gender will play for sure a role uh, very important in the in the future planning processes in urban mobility in Maputo. Thank you very much for that. I cannot see any questions on the chat, but of course, if you have any, uh, you can reach out to us directly and we will try to get in contact with the speakers. Now, before closing the session, I would like to give the floor to give three sentences to Julia. Um, so please, Julia. Thank you, Nico. Thanks for the amazing uh, moderation and for the two presentations. I also saw that a lot of our participants are from organizations and places where I have found lots of good practice examples. So you, a lot of you are already working towards those um, measures. And uh, I'm really impressed by the insights from Mapucho. I wanted to say that I think this placemaking, these placemaking methods really show how a gender responsive city could really look like, and this ties back to what Marina said about creating a vision for gender responsive mobility. Um, so I think they were both really much aligned and uh, I'm really excited that you are all here today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julia, and thank you again to our speakers, to Marina and Lloyd. It was very interesting and insightful. Uh, and it's very nice always to work with cities that are members of Mobilize Your City. So before closing, I would like to invite all the participants to also join our upcoming sessions. We are going to have, there are four in the, in the pipeline, so two in English and two in French, that we will cover paratransit, 
participation processes, financing, uh, active modes of transport and road safety. So we had tried to put the link on the slides, uh, but still uh, we're going to send a um, follow up email with the information of this session. This uh, set of slides that we use today are becoming uh, training materials for you to replicate this training uh, if needed in your projects. So in the up upcoming email, uh, we won't have that, but it will be part of our knowledge platform. So we will give you updates of this very soon when it's ready.